glad to see your shining faces once again. Anybody face not shining here? I don't see it. <laughs> Thank you. Megawatt smiles on everybody. Please keep Janine in your prayers as she recovers from the nasty bout of pneumonia. Let me get myself together here. It always helps, don't you think? Um, you know, sainthood in popular parlance means a person who really is holier than thou, a person far removed from the lives that you and I live every day and the troubles with which we deal, a person who conveniently has nothing at all to do with things that really matter in life, you know, like economics and <laughs> politics. A saint in popular understanding is easily relegated to the shelf as a statue to dust and to perhaps pray to or through, to be thought about in pious moments, to be made a hero, sanitized, made into a legend or a fairy tale at bedtime. Martin Luther King Jr. wasn't a saint of this sort at all. Now the sainthood for which Dr. King has been honored is a sainthood born of the concepts which you wouldn't want to share with your children at bedtime. The dark underbelly of our great American experiment. Racism, hatred, violence, blood, death, threats, general nastiness is the stuff of which his sainthood is formed. For Dr. King is a saint, I think, in the technical sense of the word. Let me read to you from the Penguin Dictionary of the Saints, which, of course, is 100% always accurate. <laughs> here's, here's what the Penguin Dictionary says is a saint. A saint is not faultless. She does not always think and behave well and wisely. One who has occasion to oppose him is not always wrong or foolish. Nor is she canonized, that is, officially recognized by the church as a saint, because she had visions or was reputed a wonder worker. He or she is canonized because their personal daily life was lived not merely well, but at an heroic level of Christian faithfulness and integrity, or, if a martyr, because of the circumstances of their violent death. So real saints have vision and the courage to attain that vision and the willingness even to put their lives online for that vision. Real sainthood often requires giving up one's life, one's respectability, and one's social standing. Dr. King was that sort of man, I believe, as were many others in the struggle for civil rights in the 60s. I was a young teenager in Virginia, in a small town, that happened to have one of the uh, major all-black colleges in the United States in the 60s. I sat at the lunch counter that was integrated the week before. I knew there was anger and violence and grief all around me. I didn't quite get it in my privilege what was really going on. I did know that Dr. King at that time was a very controversial figure. Church people were a yes and no about it. Was he a domestic terrorist upsetting the apple cart that we all know had problems but not that bad? Or was he a freedom fighter and a prophet pointing out to us the stuff we didn't want to see? He was beaten by police many times. He was jailed many times. I ha happened to serve in Chicago with a rabbi that was jailed with him in Birmingham. He suffered, as did many fighters in those days, with bodily humiliations at the hands of the people responsible to enforce the laws. His telephones were tapped by the FBI. J. Edgar Hoover had a special file on him right in his desk. Smear and rumor campaigns were conducted against him and his movement by the opposition, including, it turns out, the American government trying to subvert the whole thing. We all, I'm thinking, looking around, but we all remember this, most of us here, I think. We lived 
through it. Yet, in the face of this, he remained committed to the Christian, his Christian vision of God's just society. As written, he believed in our Constitution and in the Bible that he read and we read. He pushed and he pushed and he pushed our structures. And, I mean, I remember my parents saying, I sort of agree with this, but I don't agree with the method. You know, I, okay, let's get there. Let's get to the promised land, but I don't like this way. We have that. He pushed and pushed and pushed our structures and institutions, including our churches, remember, until they began to see things differently. I remember in our little white Episcopal church in downtown Hampton, Virginia, when all this unrest was going and students from Hampton Institute, the All Black College, were sitting in the balcony. <gasps> and I wondered, will the priest give them communion if they come to the altar? Hmm. He troubled conscience of Christians by his witness. And for that, I think he remains a true saint. That is why he's remembered as a martyr on the Episcopal Church's calendar for January the 15th. There is, I think, a striking human tendency to render the witness of those who are most visionary and most courageously, most courageous in our society, ineffective. Let me redo that sentence. <laughs> It's a tendency of the human soul to render ineffective the witness of those who are most visionary and most courageous. If you don't want to rock the boat, everybody loves you. FBI doesn't care about you. No. If you're rocking the boat, uh oh, uh oh. You know, Jesus wasn't killed because he was a nice guy or because he changed water into wine at a friend's wedding. He wasn't killed because he was a man of prayer, no. He was killed because he was a man with a vision, a firm vision of God that happened to upset the ruling political powers of his day. No separation of church and state back then. Uh -huh. He was killed because the politicians were irked with him enough to kill him. If Jesus had been content to remain the guru of 12 men and unaccounted women, we would not know of him today. Instead, he understand that prayer without action was useless. Prayer without action was useless. That religion without application to life is a euphemism for amnesia. That belief without courage and commitment to act is bad belief. Bad belief. Dr. King wasn't assassinated for being a dreamer. <laughs> we like dreamers. We like dreams. He was assassinated for daring to trouble the power structure of our society. Structures which still, I believe, still exist. Here are these timeless words he wrote to the churches in Birmingham, Alabama, when he was in their jail. They're timeless words because, as I'm reading them, I'm like, oh, he could be, he could be writing this to us today. And it speaks to me powerfully as a man who tries to be a Christian and tries to do what God would want me to do in this life. Perhaps it would speak to you too. Here it is. It's the letter from the Birmingham jail. In deep disappointment, I have wept over the laxity of the church. But be assured that my tears have been tears of love. There can be no deep disappointment where there is not deep love. Yes, I love the church. How could I not do otherwise? I am in a rather unique position of being the son, the grandson, and the great-grandson of preachers. There was a time when the church was very powerful. <coughs> the time when the early church rejoiced at being <coughs> deemed worthy to suffer for what they believed. In those days, the church was not merely a thermometer, 
that recorded the ideas and principles of popular opinion. It was a thermostat that transformed the attitudes of society. Whenever the early Christians entered a town, the people in power became disturbed and immediately sought to arrest them for being disturbers of the peace. Oh my God, disturbers of the peace. But Christians pressed on with the conviction that they were called to serve God rather than man. Small in number, they were big in commitment. They were too God intoxicated to be intimidated. You're hearing the wonderful cadences of Dr. King. Things are different now. So often the modern church is weak, an ineffectual voice with an uncertain sound. Far from being disturbed by the presence of the church, the power structure of the average American community is consoled by the church's silence. But the judgment of God is upon the church as never before. If today's church does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authenticity, the loyalty of millions, and be dismissed as a social club with no meaning for the 20th century. Friends, am I, or are you, a thermometer or a thermostat? <laughs> the choice is always ours.